everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you for stopping by. Hello, my darlings. Lovely to see you all. And yes, by popular request, I'm wearing the shirt with the hole in it. This could be the only channel where the audience actually requests the shirt that I wear. Like, who requests a hole in a shirt? <laughs> but somebody did, in fact a lot of people did, and so I'm wearing it just for you. Uh, today I'm gonna do the midterms next year, the GOP, the Dems, how they're gonna fare, what's the interaction gonna be like between now and then, that's really very interesting. I also did Flight 19, the Bermuda Triangle, accident thing that happened in 1945 where planes disappeared and everybody wonders why I did that. Uh, Michael Cohen's handwriting I took a look at, plus the uh, recall uh, which is going on in California where uh, a radio host called Larry Elder is hoping to replace incumbent governor Gavin Newsom. So that's that. Oh, and I also did transition pictures for Jimi Hendrix. Thank you to everybody who subscribed this week. Uh, lovely to have you along, to the donors. Wow, I treasure you like crazy. You are super darlings, and I really appreciate your appreciation. Thank you very much. To all the commenters, somebody said that the astrologer, like uber astrologer, Pam Gregory, had been mentioning my channel. That's incredible, if so. I mean, she's like the queen of astrology, this woman. Uh, why she's mentioning me, I don't know, but uh, thank you, Pam. <laughs> I'm very, very grateful. Uh, also, yes, Andrew Cuomo has resigned in New York. I'm shocked at how fast the pitch has happened with that. Remember, he was cowering under this disc with this rain thing. I don't believe it. It's not happening to me. It's not happening. Meanwhile, all these accusations were coming in and his uh, position became untenable. Well, he's resigned. And I said that the thing would pass over and he'd be left just standing there going, oh, this actually isn't so bad. I quite like the fact that there's no pressure on me. So he's going to go through some kind of a honeymoon resignation period, I think. But then there were dark skies ahead, like he has to face a whole bunch of stuff down the line. Anyway, let's get on with the attempt to recall Gavin Newsom, the governor of California. The favourite right now is a radio host called Larry Elder. He's a lawyer, he's a real conservative, and because he has a platform, he's got this syndicated radio show, and he's made documentaries, and he's got a newspaper column, he actually can reach a lot of people and persuade them that he has a way to make California work again. Because California is not only a state, but it's in a bit of a state. It's got a terrible homeless problem, I mean, really atrocious. It's got wildfires, it's got uh, the COVID thing uh, rampaging through cities again. There's a lot going on that Gavin Newsom has had to deal with. And a lot of people are saying, look, we're going to move out. We're going to go to Texas or whatever. And uh, well, good luck with that anyway. But uh, they're leaving. And Larry Elder, I guess, is saying, look, you know, I can solve this. I have a radio show. Of course I know what to do. Like we need another celebrity to run anything. But uh, he is a staunch Trump supporter, which should sound alarm bells already. He's a libertarian. He wants to abolish the IRS completely. No minimum wage laws, so everybody scrambles over each other's backs to get paid. He wants to overturn Roe v. Wade. He's against any kind of mask or vaccine mandate. And he doesn't believe in climate science. So I thought I'd take a look at Larry Elder's pictures. When I found him, he was on some metal structure. You know, in Chicago, where the rail track is built on metal girders above your head and it runs around over your head? This was like that. Two tracks, one foot on one, one foot on the other. This may be his radio show and his political career, trying to do both at the same time. So he carries on, but with his legs split dangerously apart. <laughs> but up ahead is a mist. And if you remember, I said last time, mists are about uncertainty. Not quite knowing how things are going to work out. Not being able to see too far ahead into the future. In the mist, there were these four drums, like metal towers. And they had bike chains crafted into them. And they were spinning. And as Larry Elder goes through, with his legs split apart, as he goes through, these bike chains 
take little chunks of him. So it could be brutal, this. To his ego, if nothing else. And when he emerged out of the mist, he was depleted. Oh, that was really, really tough. Not only that, but from then on, the road became cobbled or full of really, really rough stones that were difficult to walk on. Until he came to a hill. None of this seems to be easy at all. By the time he'd emerged from the chains and the mist, and he'd gone over the cobbles, and he'd gone up the hill, and he climbed down the ladder on the other side, he was in a hollow that was very, very difficult to get out of. Dispirited or clueless. Maybe he wins and he doesn't know what to do about governing California, which has one of the biggest economies in the entire world. But just to make sure, I thought I'd put him against Gavin Newsom. Gavin Newsom was walking along quite sprightly, quite uh, energetically. Larry Elder was behind him, goes, hey, Gav. Gavin Newsom turns around and Larry Elder says, come on, you've got to hear this. Grabs his elbow and seems like he's going to whisper something really funny in his ear or something really trenchant or whatever. And as he's about to, he goes, ah, fooled you. And he runs ahead. He pulls some kind of stunt or trick or something. I don't know what it is. And leaves Gavin Newsom behind. Ugh, look at me now. I'm on my way to being governor. <laughs> fooled that guy, right? That's what it feels like. But the road he has to climb is slippery. It's almost like it has oil on it or soap or something. And, he's, whoa, whoa, and his feet really don't sit very well on the ground. Gavin Newsom sees this from afar and goes, See, it's not as easy as you think, pal. Larry Elder overcomes this. There's a wall in his path that he can't climb over. Luckily, there's a door, a big, thick, medieval type door with metal bars across it and a lock. There's your answer, Larry. Get through there and you might win. But where's the key? He says, I can't get through this door. It's big and thick and there's a wall and, and where's the key? As he's pondering this, Gavin Newsom comes up behind him with one of those big medieval jailer type key rings. You know, they have big clanky keys on them. And he goes, excuse me, coming through. He takes one of the keys, he goes to the door, it fits in the door, he unlocks it and goes through the door. And Larry Elder goes, you had a key? All along you had a key? Gavin Newsom, who's on the other side of the door, looks around and goes, Oh, Larry, you still here? <laughs> Bye! And slams the door. Larry Elder runs to the end of the wall in time to see Gavin Newsom way in the distance. Now, I don't do winning or losing. I say this every single time. I have no idea who will win this race. It could just be that Larry Elder gets to the door and doesn't need it. He's just won. And he'll figure out the rest later. By the time he gets to look around the wall, Gavin Newsom is off doing something else and is no longer governor. That's possible, I guess. That's an interpretation. But it did seem like Larry Elder was not suited to this process. I also did Michael Cohen's handwriting. Now, I know I did Madison Cawthorn's handwriting last time and hadn't expected to do another one, but Michael Cohen actually posted his handwriting, which is really print, but he posted it on his Twitter feed. And I thought, oh, well, here's an opportunity to see what this guy is really like. He was a vice president of the Trump Organization and also Trump's lawyer from 2006 to 2018, possibly, until everything came crashing down. He was raided and he was charged with tax fraud and campaign finance violations and a whole bunch of stuff and sentenced to three years imprisonment. In fact, in the end, because of COVID, he got uh, home detention. But still, it has been a mighty come down for this guy. But he has completely, with his book Disloyal and various interviews, turned on his former employer. And he's not only given tons and tons of testimony and interviews to the authorities, but he described Trump in his book Disloyal as a cheat, a mobster, a liar, a fraud, a bully, a racist, 
a predator and a con man. <laughs> How's that for redemption? So I thought it'd be very interesting to look at his handwriting and see what he was really like. Highly communicative, enthusiastic, controlling, intense, very tightly wound, it seems. The handwriting is very crammed together. And a bad guy to cross, as he's likely to keep on and on and on until he makes his point. He's very protective of others when he feels a responsibility towards them. And he's quite a sturdy, self-made individual who's unafraid to stand up for himself and may even have had to stand alone and stand his ground several times in his life. This has built fortitude and determination and strength of character. If you need someone who's resourceful and able and willing to get things done, often on the fly, then he's your man. He's very curious and perceptive when he's involved and interested. He's unafraid to make his point. He likes to plan and look ahead to what needs to be done, if only to protect his interests and make sure he's not exposed to undue liability or unforeseen fallout. His defense mechanism can make him prickly, sharply combative, and eager to strike first if necessary, especially if he feels he's been harmed. There's a cunning edge of retribution to his writing in places that would make him a fierce opponent. Earlier in life, he probably said, I want it all, about his hopes and dreams. And he set about making those hopes and dreams a reality. He reached higher than perhaps he felt was possible and somehow pulled through. But this may have made him a target for those who didn't like his attitude, his methods, or his unwillingness to back down once his hackles were raised. Isn't that interesting? I was also asked to look at Flight 19, which is a huge mystery, apparently, for people who are interested in that kind of thing. I'd never heard of it. But uh, apparently five torpedo bombers in 1945 went out on a training mission from Fort Lauderdale and they were supposed to come back. Only they didn't come back. And uh, somewhere on the line, they got confused about where they were. Fort Lauderdale was over here. Bermuda was over there, and they thought Bermuda was, I don't know. Anyway, they got confused, and uh, they didn't come back. They just vanished. They ran out of fuel and crashed into the ocean. So all five planes vanished. Their crew members, I think 14 of them, also vanished, and uh, because they drowned. And uh, then another plane that went to look for them exploded en route, killing 13 more people. And so they vanished too. A lot of planes and boats over the years have disappeared without trace in the triangle of ocean between Bermuda, Miami, and Puerto Rico. Now, of course, thousands and thousands and thousands of boats and planes haven't disappeared in that area, but that doesn't mean that people aren't interested in the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. And I know there's like a whole Atlantis thing going on, an aliens thing going on, none of which I buy into, but uh, people are still interested in this. So I thought I'd take a look at Flight 19, but before I did, I took one of the crew members and did not transition pictures, but sort of crossover pictures to see what happened, All right? I'm not gonna tell you which crew member in case they have family uh, alive today, which they probably have. So uh, what happened was when I went into the energy of this particular crew member, I see that cavern thing, as always, and the guy was floating down like a ballet dancer, actually, drifting and drifting and circling and circling and circling and then landed. But the ground, the you know, metaphorical ground, um, wasn't real. It was cushioned. It was a bit like marshmallow. And the guy fell into it and he took his last breath and that was it. But as soon as he took his last breath, his last physical breath, the marshmallow released him. And he turned over on his back and went, oh. and of course he's not breathing air now because he's drowned. But he's breathing notional air. It's like, oh, I'm free. Oh, that was tough. Oh, that was a tight spot. 
Then I thought, what I'll do is I'll take one of the five planes that crashed, because I'm not drawing five planes. I had trouble enough drawing one. But uh, I'll draw uh, one plane and see what happens to that. It's flying along. As it does so, it goes through, this is really weird, right? It goes through what in the pictures seem like a curtain. But it was made up of energy. It wasn't solid, it was made up of energy. You know, if you're on a desert road, where it's been really, really hot, and you look into the distance and it shimmers. It shimmers because of the heat. This energy was like that. It shimmered. It was a curtain of shimmering air. And the plane went into it this way. But when it emerged on the other side of the curtain, it wasn't facing this way. It was facing over there. Now, the plane's instruments all shut down, it turns out. that They didn't know where they were or where they were going. Something happened with their instruments. But it was after this curtain of whatever it was, electromagnetic energy or microwaves or I don't know what it was. And of course they ran out of fuel then, they couldn't get back. And they just said, I think we'll all go down together. And they did, and they died. But maybe that also explains why the second plane went down too, losing 13 more crew members. 27 people died in this incident going through this energy curtain. I thought that was kind of fascinating. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do them separately, first of all, the GOP and the Democrats for 2022. Then I'm going to put the two together and see how they fare in competition with each other. Right? I think that's clear. I'm explaining it to myself, by the way, not to you. <laughs> I think that's clear. So uh, let's do the GOP first. When I went into the energy for 2022, the GOP was a little figure flying through the air. And ahead was a large wall with mini tunnels through it. And the GOP goes into one of the tunnels. It didn't really matter which one, I guess. And it was a long, dark tunnel. So obviously there's going to be a lot of nervousness around this election. A lot of dirty tricks even, maybe. A lot of fighting and brawling and accusations and uh, disinformation and stuff. When it reaches the other end of the tunnel, it leans out and looks around up the wall where all the other tunnel exits are. Now, some of these tunnel exits are bricked up, so whoever was in them couldn't get out. They lost their seat, I guess. Or they lost the race, or they didn't make it as far as they were hoping to go. But some did, and they flew out, and that was enough to convince the GOP that they'd had some kind of success. When I looked at the Democratic energy for 2022, it seemed to be like the flat side of a cheese grater. But the Democrats were being forced through from the other side and coming out like little grated cheese bits. It was really hard going. A lot of pressure and determination was needed to get this cheese through the holes. Many of the bits of cheese landed on the pile at the bottom. Didn't go anywhere. And it seemed almost as if this pile represented cannon fodder. Now, do you know what cannon fodder is? Some people don't. It's like when they used to have huge armies in the Middle Ages attacking a castle, and the people inside the castle would fire cannons at them. And of course, you didn't want to be at the front of the attacking army because the cannonballs would hit you and kill you. Uh, you want to be at the back. I'd be at the back eating a sandwich and go, you guys go, I'll, uh, I'll follow whenever you're done. <laughs> and then I just swan in at the end, uh, still chewing. But anyway, so um, you don't want to be at the front of the army because you're going to get killed by arrows or, uh, or cannonballs or whatever. They are cannon fodder. They're the ones that don't matter, who die first in a fight. And that's what this looked like. It seemed like some of these candidates were not ideal. They were there, they did their best with what they had, but they weren't perfectly crafted or qualified or whatever for the race ahead. And particularly for the cannon fire 
that would be coming at them from the GOP. The GOP seems to have it down. They don't care. They're shameless. They'll say anything, do anything to win. The Democrats are hindered horribly by conscience. So a lot of the people who aren't the right kind of stuff, the right material, seem to be left behind on this heap. And some go away and they're fine. So it looked better for the GOP than for the Dems right now. Bear in mind, this is energy today. Things can change radically between now and November 2022. But I thought what I'll do is I'll put the GOP against the Democrats together and see how that works. And this became like a tug of war. There was a wall between them, ideologically. The Republicans and the Democrats were connected at the wrists by a rope. It was tied to them. They were bound up, pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling. It was a real fight. The road ahead had a huge steep hill in it and they went right over still bound at the wrist. They're dragged into this quagmire together. At the bottom of the hill was one tunnel this time. It's like a really bad advent calendar. One, tu <laughs> one door you can open. Uh, one tunnel. And the GOP jumped in and dragged the Democrats in their wake. So the GOP was leading all the way down this tunnel because there was no way that the Democrats could overtake them. When they get to the end of this particular tunnel, there is a ledge and the Republicans stand on the ledge and whew, relieved that they made it. Hardly able to believe that they got as far as they did, given what was pitted against them. The Democrats have no ledge. They teeter. They can't believe either that the situation is what it is. They made it. They're okay. It's not as bad as it could have been. But it does seem that the GOP has a little bit of a lead. As I said, a lot of this can change. But from the pictures and the energy around it, it did seem like the Democrats were choosing the weaker candidates. And finally... Let's do uh, transition pictures for Jimi Hendrix. He was born in Seattle and only had like four years of massive success before he died of a drug overdose. But those four years established him as one of the greatest of all time. Now, because of my Asperger thing, I can't take discord or feedback. So there was no way I was ever going to be interested in Jimi Hendrix. I can't tell you a single thing he recorded. I can't tell you what he sounded like as a person. I know nothing about him whatsoever. But anyway, he died a legend and uh, loads of people asked for his pictures. So I took a look. And when I went into the energy, again, that cave that I always see, he was above my head in a sort of pose, like somebody who was on a surfboard or something, but frozen in place, like suspended animation. After a time, he floated down and just stood there. Very solid, very calm, actually. But this got quite peculiar because instead of the normal rest of the cave that I would see, there was an enormous mirror at an angle. And he climbed up it and sat at the top, reviewing his 27 years alive as a mortal. And in the pictures, these appeared like a slab, a solid slab, something you could assess from beginning to end and look at and examine as you would a cake or something. You know when people say my whole life flashed before my eyes it had that feel to it like I can see my life now from every angle I can see what it consisted of when it began when it ended what I did in between. This guy it was almost like an old soul who knew he'd been round several times because he was able to assess his contract. He had signed up for something that had begun when the contract said and ended when the contract said. And it didn't 
make him happy at a consciousness level to think that it had ended. It somehow didn't seem fair even though he had agreed to it prior to his birth. And he stands upon this mirror and goes, there's nothing I can do. Take me. I'm yours. And he threw himself off, imagining that the arms of grace would collect him up and carry him to where he needed to go. That's not what happened. He just fell. There were billowing sheets, um, pillows, a duvet, it doesn't really matter, it was very soft. Again, I got that feeling that he had been here before. He had some kind of trace memory of this process. And he stood up, and it was like, oh, so there's nobody to help me? And the universe kind of goes, well, no, you know the drill. You've got to do this. You've got to take action. And that's how it works in life. Unless you make a move, the universe doesn't know you're serious and will just sit back and wait. Once you decide to make a move with serious intention, the universe goes, oh, right, he or she is serious. I'm going to help out. And it steps in, divine intelligence steps in, and unseen forces come to your aid. If you just sit back and wait for something to happen, it's like that prayer thing I was talking about before. If you just sit back and wait for something to happen, oh, please help me, nothing happens. He walks across this billowing sheet thing, and there is the tunnel that I normally see. Up to this point, it had been obscured from view, but now he became sad weary, more aware than ever that his contract had ended. Can't I have longer? Come on, I made a mistake. Let's make it 50 or 55 years or 60 years. So what happened with Jesus in uh, Gethsemane, the negotiation with, uh, with God. He drags his feet up this tunnel. That period of contemplation on the mirror, of reflection, and the subsequent billowing sheet thing, were his opportunity to wrestle with his ego concerns. To get perspective on who he really was and what he was there to do. But it didn't lift his mood when he was going up the tunnel. And he was still trying to renegotiate terms. But it's why I say that in mortal terms, we go, when a child dies at age 10, or uh, when somebody dies at 40, we, oh, their life was so short. Oh, the poor thing, what a terrible thing. In universal terms, it's simply a contractual matter. This is what you agreed to. This is what we're claiming. It's like a pound of flesh. It's a contract. But he was stubborn in that regard. And when he got to the cave where the light is, I always see, he wouldn't do anything else. He was still trying to make his case at a soul level for not progressing. And for the very first time, because he wouldn't succumb to the pull, and because he tried to renegotiate his contract at the last minute, he began to fragment right there in front of the light. Because by fragmentation and dissipation, his energy was less able to resist. Surrender is the only way at this particular point. We have to surrender to higher forces. And once he was dissipated, it made it easier for the forces to pull him into the light. A million tiny fragments are easier to pull in than uh, one big object. And that's what happened. He drifted into the light as a million tiny pieces. 
and just went. We have a contract. The terms are the terms. What we do with the time and opportunity afforded to us on the planet while we're in these mortal um, capsules, what we do is totally up to us. Whether we follow our soul's path or we don't. Whether we take the path of higher intention or the path of lesser intention. It's, it's all up to us. We have free will within the terms of that contract. But once it's over, it's over. Whether that's five years, 90 years, we agreed to it. Which is why it's important to make the most of every day, of every opportunity, of every chance to smile and show love and be grateful, to be present and to act deliberately and consciously with intention. Not sit and watch TV and waste our hours. Some people say they binge watch television series. Do something. Create something. Build something. Use your life productively. Be present. And enjoy what you have. That seemed to be the message of this because it's soon over. And that was Jimi Hendrix. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, like, subscribe, share if you would. Follow me on Twitter, at Cash Peters. Otherwise, I'll see you next time, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.